I'd like to also welcome all of you joining us online. By the way, have you heard of uh, this thing called Empathy Museum? Empathy Museum. This it's a pop-up museum that was started in 2015, was created by an artist and a philosopher. And the premise of this museum is that when you walk in, you have to take off your shoes, and they'll give you another pair of shoes, very different from that of yours, right? And, and these shoes used to belong to uh, people like uh, the grandmaster chess player from Russia, or a roller derby player, or a local truck driver, or a pediatric nurse. And the Empathy Museum is designed to help you experience that old saying, you cannot understand another person until you walk a mile in their shoes. And, and the whole experience is curated to help you see the world through the perspective of others. And this is what the Apostle Paul was trying to do as he writes in 1 Corinthians, his letter to the church in Corinth in chapter 9. Now, if you have been with us, we as a church, we've been going through Apostle Paul's writing. And Paul is the founder of this young, growing church. And he's writing this letter to instruct him on how to, how to faithfully live for Jesus. And the first eight chapters, they were kind of like messy, right? You have uh, people, Christians were, argue, this is their local church. Christians were arguing over who is a superior Christian than the other Christian. Or they were saying like, okay, which pastor is a better paps pastor to be baptized under? There were divisions in the church, sexual misbehaviors, misguided understanding of singleness and marriage. And here we come in chapter 9. There are 16 chapters. So we are over the halfway point. And, and, and what we experience here is something a little different. There's an inspiration. There's an inspiration with Paul saying, brothers and sisters, we should be doing everything possible so that heaven can be populated with God's people. And we should do everything possible so that we can win people to Christ. So that's the theme of, of today's, today's message. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn uh, along with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. I will begin in verse 19. And when we read this together, not together, together, but I'll read it for you. You're going to hear the word, uh, one particular word that is repeated. And that word is when, when. Now, uh, for those of you who are into personality inventory tests like DISC or uh, Enneagram, if you are Enneagram 3, this is your love language. Win, achieve, success, going all out, do best you can. But Paul's understanding of win is very different than how our society would define win. So, so follow along with me. This is God's active and living word for us today. Verse 19, he writes, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, by the way, they're, they're Gentiles. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And to the weak, I became weak, that I might win for the fifth time to win the weak. So let me pause here. So Paul here picks up right after where he left off in chapter 8. In chapter 8, he talked about what it means to have this freedom in Christ right? Freedom in Christ. And in verse 19, he, he jumps right in immediately by saying, I'm a free man. No one owns me. There's no master above me, Paul says. However, however, I have made myself a servant to righteousness or servant to all those people who don't yet know Jesus. And that word servant, by the way, in the original Greek is translated as slave. So he's saying, I've become a slave to people. What does that mean? There's another time in, in Book of Romans chapter 6 where that expression, I have made myself a slave, is mentioned. And so what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6 is this, that as followers of Jesus, that we are united in Christ. There's a, there's a union, right? We, we are, for those who are in Christ, we are, we are eternally together here and now. So when, when Jesus died on the cross, we also died with him. When Jesus rose from the dead, we also rose from the dead because we are united. 
So as followers of Christ, we're no longer slaves to sin, we're slaves to righteousness. And Paul is saying, I am a slave to the gospel. My master is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And everything I do, I dedicate my, my life for, for Jesus. And I have given my life to win as many people as possible to the good news of Jesus. Then he continues on in what I would call a, a summary statement of chapter 9. In fact, I would say that this may be uh, Paul's life mission statement. Do you have a life mission statement? Do you have a life goal that you strive after? Because if you don't have one, this is a pretty good one. Verses 22 and 23. It goes like this. He writes, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with him in its blessing. And Paul is saying here, friends, it is an incredible honor incredible honor and blessing for us to partner with God, to join him in him on God's mission to see the salvation of, of God's people. It's incredible honor. And now for some people, um, when we hear that word salvation, we, we, we see salvation as merely uh, the, about the meeting the minimal entrance requirements possible needed to get into heaven when we die. But that's not what Paul's saying here. That's not what Jesus taught. That's not what salvation is. Now, I like what John, John Orberg says about salvation. This is what he writes, quote, Salvation is an invitation to know God and to experience his presence, favor, and power starting right here on earth, right here, right now, that we don't have to wait till we die, but we can experience God's salvation as God's people right here. When Callum prayed for us, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can experience God's heaven right here, right now. And yes, yes, it's true that the rescue boat came from heaven to earth to rescue us so we can have eternal life with God. That's very true. But this rescue boat is not a two-seater boat just for me and God. And because the boat came to save us, the boat needs to go back out to rescue others. And we get to join in and participating in seeing God's people come into the boat, so to speak. And yes, church, we're, we're, we're supposed to come together and have communion and fellowship and we pray and we sing. Those are all good things, but we can remain in our huddles. We are church scattered to go out to participate in what God is doing and join in in God's incredible, God's shalom mission, shalom meaning peace, kingdom of God. The wholeness is taking place, and we don't have to wait till we go to heaven. We can do that right now. So let me flesh out what Paul meant when he said, for us to be all things to all people, and by all means that some can be saved. Let me tell you what all things uh, to all people does not mean. It does not mean for us to uh, be wishy-washy in our beliefs or compromise on, on what we believe in order for us to adapt to the culture. You know, God is not calling us to be like chameleon Christians and, you know, just kind of go with, with whatever the culture is going. That's not what it means to be all things to all people. It also does not mean for church, for church to do all things for all people. Right, Because the danger there is that we become a consumer Christians. And we're offering, as church, we're offering religious goods and services just to provide needs to for all people. That, that's, not, that's not what Paul is saying. So when Paul says to become all things to all people, what he's saying is that we need to have a posture of hospitality and servanthood and have the willingness to give up our preferences and our privileges so we can interact with all kinds of people, every walks of life, every socioeconomic class, from all generations. So today is World Communion Sunday, and we're joining with billions of Christians saying that there's only one church. And I'm so grateful that as HP Press, that we, with gladness, believe in that one day, a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language will be standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And friends, this is the reason why our church sends out missionaries to Northern Africa, to Spain, to Latin America, to, to different parts of the world. 
This is why we have uh, church planning networks in Cuba and Haiti so the flourishing of God's people will take place in various parts of the world. And then next Sunday, you know what's happening next Sunday? We're sending out a team of people to start and plant a brand new church in Oak Cliff part of Dallas, led by our pastor Andrew Frank- Franklin and his wife Alex. I'm so grateful that we're part of, of God's movement because you see different people groups need to hear the same gospel in their own cultural voices so that all people can experience the love of God. And I love Paul's strategy to accomplish this. Paul's strategy to win people was by losing. You win by losing. Let me explain. You win by losing. You see, Paul knew that in order to win others, we have to lay aside our personal differences for the sake of of others. Because he didn't let non-essential things in life to create barriers uh, for him and being a witness for Jesus to others. Because here's the reality. The person that you're sitting next to and the person that's sitting in front of you and sitting behind you, we're all very different kinds of people, right? It doesn't matter that you, some of you went to same high school. I realize that. You may be in the same household. I get that. But we're very different people because that's the way that God created us. So if you and I, if we spend, we're nice and kind people here, right? Nice people here. If if you and I, if we spend enough time together speaking and talking and learning about each other, I guarantee you, you're going to find some, we're going to find some differences. And you're going to find some things about me that you're not going to like. And you might be frustrated uh, with me, right? And if we allow our differences to be the focus of our relationship, then that's going to be the barrier to any deeper connection and deeper friendship. Let me give you an example. If I passionately argue with you that why I believe CNN news source is much better than Fox News or vice versa, right? And, and I try to win that argument and I make that major, major thing in my life and I'm willing to die on that hill. You know what else dies on that hill? My ability to form relationship with you. The, the bridge that, was, that I'm supposed to have to, to lead others to Christ now becomes a barrier because I want to win, because I want to be right. And sometimes when the culture opposes the church, we feel like the only way we can respond is by fighting back with the exact same force. And we forget what Jesus said. The second greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. So what Paul is talking about here is that In his lifetime, there were all kinds of people with different moral convictions. You had the Jews, they were following the law. You had the Gentiles, they were outside the law. And you had the weak people, weak in their faith. And Paul did not compromise to meet their needs. What he did was he entered into their world. He wore their shoes, so to speak, so he can win some for to Jesus. So I think the question that we need to ask is, what are we willing to lay aside? What are we willing to give up and lose so that others can come to know Jesus? Perhaps it's our reputation, because I know, you know reputation is big for, for Dallas culture, how people think of us. Or maybe even it's your job, so that you're able to, to maintain friendships and relationships and have contacts. All right, let me go on to verses 24 through 26. And here, Paul's going to use sports analogy to drive his point about winning people to Christ. Verse 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So in the ancient Olympics, when an athlete wins a big race, right, their their big prize was this wreath, a crown made out of vegetation, right? So like uh, fig leaves, Pine branches. Sometimes they would use dead celery. Imagine wearing like broccoli on your head, right? That's what people did. Now, obviously, there's no worth and value with these crowns. Um, It's not like having a real gold medal or or, a diamond-studded Super Bowl ring where it's really actually worth something. 
back then. But here, here, here's what came with the crown in the ancient days. It's what came afterwards. What would happen is that you would be paraded around your hometown, and you would be a hero. The local civic leaders would throw a big party for you. They would commission musicians and poets to write a song about you. They would put together a statue in your honor and your name, and they would worship you because you are this great athlete. And Paul says, all that, all that you receive is so, so temporary. It'll fade away. But the cause that we have as Christ followers, he says, that we will receive a crown that will last forever. And the crown and this this reward that Paul is talking about is not salvation. It's not entering into heaven. Paul already has salvation. He's already in Christ. So the reward that we hear in 1 Corinthians 9 is this eternal reward of Jesus crowning us with his voice, saying, well done, my faithful servant. Well done, my faithful servant. You have been faithful with few things. That's the reward that we get to experience and see from our Lord Jesus. And the thing is that whether we know it or not as Christians, we are running this race. And this race that we're running is not with other people, but it's, it's, it's us. But it's against the enemy inside of us, the apathy and selfishness. That's why Paul says, man, we need, to, we need to condition ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to, we need to run the race. Don't just talk about running the race. Actually do it. Don't just talk about loving other people, but actually love people. Don't just box in the air, but actually box, fight. Go for it. Win to compete, he says. And I think when it comes to evangelism, if we are really honest, we're so cautious and hesitant about talking about Jesus because we don't want to offend others. Is that true? I think that's true. We're just so gentle and uh, fragile when, we, you know, when it comes to talking about Jesus. And I get it. I know how hard it is to talk about Jesus with fellow classmates and neighbors and families, especially families. And I get that, extended families. And if you're anything like me, here's my confession. I don't always like to talk about Jesus. All right, I know I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to talk about Jesus, but I don't always like to talk about Jesus because I don't want to be seen as a normal person, right? I get, I get afraid too. I get discouraged when people don't follow Jesus. I don't always talk about Jesus. This is why I think it's so good for us to have that encouraging voice in our life, someone who come alongside us and says, you can do it. Let me push you. Let me encourage you. Take that extra step. Try it. I'm going to challenge you. Earlier this year, I was uh, playing pickup basketball with our church staff team in our church gym, and we were uh, divide ourselves into two teams. I was on one team, and Brian was on the other team. Brian is our senior pastor. By the way, if you don't know about Brian, Brian is a a D1 college athlete, athletic, uh, great endurance, and here we are. We're playing this game of basketball, going back and forth, and of course, our team wins, right? (laughs) And... uh, and Brian goes, hey, let's play another game. I said, sure, we'll play again. We're playing the game, and we win again, right? This is really fun, and you could tell. Brian is Enneagram 3. He likes to win, right? He likes to win. So we said, okay, let's play again, and I th- we won again. And he's saying, okay, let's play again. So you know he's trying to out-muscle, out-endure us. And here's what happened. It's what happened the next day. I did not get injured while I was playing, but next day, I, I could not walk. My knees, my knees were, something was happening to my knees to the point where it was so painful where I could not walk upstairs or downstairs. And I said, this is not normal. This is not normal. And, and this went on, no lie, for four months. Okay, this went on for four months. I was telling my staff team, oh, man, I think, I think I'm aging. I'm getting old. My knees are hurting. I can't do the things that I used to do. I'm just so cautious and hesitant about doing things. I couldn't do the things I used to do. And this went on, and I did what every normal guy would do. I did not go see a doctor, right? <laughs> but I did go on YouTube to figure out what was wrong with me, self diagnose and trying to figure out my own physical therapy sessions. I did that, and I was still hurting, but here's how good God is, right? Uh, one Sunday afternoon, I go into a restaurant. Guess who I see? I see a friend of mine. I see an orthopedic surgeon. 
and I'm telling him about what's happening to me. He goes, Jay, come see me immediately. Four months of pain, right? So I'm going in next week, and uh, here I am. I've never been to a hospital before. Now, I've been to a hospital as a pastor, visiting other people, but I have myself never been in a hospital where people are taking care of me. So I'm having to, like, take x-rays. I have never... I mean, x-rays for dental, yes, but for my knees, like, they're making me, like, do this and get your leg out, do this and turn around 360, do all that. And, and so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very, I'm afraid at this point, trepidation, like, what's wrong with me? Like, what if my, there are tears in my knees and I can't be active again? And the doctor comes in, has the x-rays, he looks at me in, in my eyes and says, Jay, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> There is nothing wrong with you. Maybe you're aging, but you're, you're fine. This looks good. This looks, actually looks really good. So go do what you used to do, right? Be active. And if you feel a pain, come back and see me two months later. But just go do it. And you know what I did that afternoon? I mean, I, I went to the gym, no lie. I started doing squats. I'm doing squats. Granted, they're only 10 pounds each. I'm, but I'm doing squats. <laughs> doing deadlifts. I'm really pushing myself. I'm doing it. I'm sharing this with you because at times as Christians, we need that encouraging voice, a voice of authority saying, you can do it. You can do it because I think when it comes to Christian faith, we're so hesitant. We're so cautious and we're not, we're not living out the way God designed us. We're so hesitant and, and careful about how we live and we need that voice of authority and encouragement saying, you can do this run the race, follow Jesus, love people well, win by losing. And ultimately, Jesus is the one who supremely showed us what it means to win by losing. He lost. He lost his life on the cross, but he won the race for us so that we can have eternal life with him. And God is inviting to bring others to be part of this incredible beautiful thing called Christian community. So let me get very practical here, and I'll close. So for this week, whether you're a student, adults, parents, young adults, college students, when you look at your week, look at your calendar this upcoming week, look at your iPhone, you know, if you have appointments, Bible studies, um, study sessions, you're meeting with someone, uh, before that meeting, pray and ask and ask God, Lord, will you allow gospel conversation to take place? Will you allow some divine appointments to take place? And watch what God does. Test God. Allow, test God and see what God does. Now, I guarantee you, God's not going to dishonor you. There's going to be something that God does by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll never know what God will do. And be willing to take a step into someone else's shoes and pray for that person on a regular basis. And if you feel like, gosh, I don't know how to invite people to church, that's okay. As Callum mentioned, invite them to Alpha, this multi-week spiritual conversation, exercise, and experience where you can just openly talk about spiritual matters, no judging, very safe environment. That's Alpha. They'll take, there's a table out in the back. It says, we prepare our hearts to come to this table of the Lord's Supper Let's ask God, Lord, um, where in my life, where in my life that I need to lose so that others can gain you, Jesus Christ? Let me pray. So, Father, will you help us? Please help us to do the same that your son has done for us and give us the posture of humility and help us lay aside our comfort our reputation, our fears, and change whatever needs to be changed in our lives in order, to pe in order that people around us might come to have saving faith in your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.